This week we're in part two, it's a little bit different. We're teaching this series together. Um, and if you didn't get here for part one last week, go to the app. Um, you can catch it on any podcast catcher, but that kind of sets the stage uh, for where we're going in this series. And so last week we said, like, all of us have relationship goals at some level. We don't always know what they are. They're not clearly defined, but we have them. And a lot of times they're misguided based on unrealistic expectations. And so um, we got to define, like, what the goal actually is. Now, here's the thing. This is what we're going to talk about for a few minutes today. All of us come into any relationship, dating relationship, especially marriage relationship, with hopes, dreams, and desires. Like, all of us have them. Doesn't matter what your faith background is, um, though I would argue it's like part of being made in the image of God. Um, You have hopes, dreams, and desires that you're coming into the relationship with. And so um, you have to determine, like, what those are. So in any relationship, you have this idea of, like, how conflict should be handled and like one of you was an internalizer, one of you was a screamer, um, two to one odds that you know who the screamer is in this relationship on stage. It's both of us. Okay, let's just be fair. Person to your left where you're sitting. And so, <laughs> you, so you know, like if you grew up, one of you, it's like if you grew up in that home where just everybody screamed and then you were totally fine on the other side of it. And then you meet somebody who's an internalizer and the first time you have an argument, they're in a fetal position in a corner somewhere thinking the relationship is over and you're like, no, I'm good. I just had to get it out. So you have ideas about conflict. Um, You have ideas about like who should do what, like in terms of, well, my mom always, my dad always, you know, when I grew up and so like responsibilities and just kind of how you're going to do life and stuff around the house. Um, You have ideas in regard to money. And apparently if you have this, you're shady uh, with it, but um, you have ideas in like one of you is a budgeter. One is you not a budgeter. Um, like we're at single income, we're going to be double income. Uh, you're going to have a side hustle. This is where we're going to, you know, you have goals in terms of where you're going to get. But like all of us have these like hopes, dreams, and desires in terms of money, how much money, how we're going to handle money. Um, you have uh, hopes, dreams, and desires in terms of vacation. One of you wants to go to the beach. One of you wants to go sledding somewhere um, or to the mountains. Um, but you have those things. You have ideas in regard to kids. Um, you want two girls, you want um, two boys, you don't want any kids, you want one boy, you had a boy, and you don't want any more kids. Um, again, um, you have ideas in terms of like what you're going to drive, like for real, right? You have hopes, dreams, and desires. Like I had uh, a great car when we got married that I had to get rid of, um, and so that killed some dreams early on. <laughs> uh, you decide that you're just going to give up on life and get a minivan, like what, whatever. Um, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. We don't have one yet. We're holding off for as no. long as we can. I know. It's crazy. So, yeah. but for real, though, the built-in vacuum cleaner for every parent, like, that's a huge plus. But um, still, you have ideas in terms of, like, how you're going to live. So we're going to rent. We're going to whatever. We're going to buy land and get goats. We're going to, um, you're part of the tiny house movement, like, whatever. Uh, but every, and sometimes they're at odds, right? Like, what their hopes and dreams are not yours. Um, you have ideas in terms of scheduling, um, like you come in, a lot of times you don't talk about this, but like you need uh, me time or you like, I want to do something with the friends every once in a while or I, you know, here's how I think we should, how much we should work. This is how many times we should take vacations. So you have all that. Um, so I got a couple more. Um, holidays is a big one. Like how are we going to split up holidays if you haven't talked through that? And so maybe your wife is gracious enough. She was like, well, I'm going to, I'll just take Christmas and Thanksgiving And then you can have Arbor Day and Halloween, <laughs> President's Day, whatever. And then everybody, let's just be real, everybody's got hopes, dreams, and desires as it relates to sex. For guys, it's, you're going to have a lot of it. And you're wondering what, I, what prop I have. I bought these, so you're safe, all right? You're safe. You're safe. Um, but kind of on the negative side, like your hopes, dreams, and desires that she's never going to show up in this ever, (laughs) ever. And I left the tag on so that, you know, I bought that yesterday. Okay. So yes. So my point is, I think that was it. My point is, should I take over? 
You should. So, okay. Well, but, yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. So what impacts what we decide that our hopes, dreams, and desires are, are the things that we've seen and heard in culture, um, in our familial experiences growing up, um, from our personalities, from previous relationships. And so what we end up doing is, is we have these hopes, dreams, and desires that we um, group together and we're like, okay, these will help me avoid all of the bad things that I experienced and grew up with. And these will help me pursue all the good things that I want and all of the good things that we want to go after. The problem is, is that this is almost like a form of self-preservation and protection because they become my hopes, my dreams, my desires. They become very self-centered. And when you get into a relationship with someone, you hand these off to them. You're like, okay, here's my hopes, my dreams, and my desires. And you hand these off to somebody and they become expectations. And so the thought is, is that now this person who's carrying all your hopes, dreams, and desires, they're expected to meet every single one of them. And you don't necessarily think it's a bad thing because again, in your mind, you're avoiding all of the bad experiences and you're pursuing all of the good things. And these expectations are, as we define them, it's the strong belief that something will happen or come true in the future. You think this is a good thing. But the person who's living under the weight of it experiences pressure and tension because what happens when they can't meet every single one of your expectations? What happens when they can't fulfill these things? And so um, it really becomes a pressure situation yeah. for them. And like, that's the thing, like on this side of the box, if you just want to use this analogy, like these are just like, these are so good. These are my hopes, my dreams, my desires. Why wouldn't you be on board with these? Yeah. Right? But on your side of the box, they just feel like expectations. Like it just feels like a weight. And here's what I talked about for a, a second last week that we're just going to kind of drill down on. And I just want to like make the point again. We probably made it five times, but those hopes, dreams, and desires are good. A lot of times, like you're trying to recreate something really good that you saw, like we want that kind of relationship. And so it's, it's kind of in this uh, a canopy of like, this is a good thing to pursue, but it can go off the rails. And the thing is, it's so subtle that a lot of times you don't even know that it's happening. Like you've been married for a while and it's like, it's not terrible. But you've moved into this thing where there's some pressure. And how we described it last week is it starts to become a debt debtor relationship. So like I owe you and you owe me because like, you know, again, my parents always or we get in this thing of like you're supposed to or last year or next time or last time. Like we went to your family and now and I thought we said about the kids and, you know, we're going to pursue whatever. Right. Yeah, like yeah. this hour. And it just becomes this thing a lot of times somewhat unspoken, but it's you owe me. And I owe you. And here's the thing that we started to talk about last week is we rarely express gratitude for what we come to expect. Mm. Like we, we just like if you hire somebody to come over to your house, like to do a job that you've contracted them to do, they probably going to show up on your Christmas card list at the end of that. Like it's just it's somewhat transactional, right? Like you did a job. Now I'm going to pay you for it. And what happens in marriage is it's subtle because like obviously we move into routines we move into like, and it's just naturally we divide like depending on how we're wired or whatever. And, um, and in that, you just kind of get into a routine that's just absolutely natural. But what happens a lot of times is we settle for that mm -hmm. and we just kind of get into that place where literally, and we kind of think there's no other choice. It's just like, well, we've been together for a while. We've been married for a little while. This is what they always do. And all of a sudden what happens is I'm never going to thank you when you do it, but I'm going to remind you when you don't. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, mm. owe you eliminates love you. It doesn't mean you're not in love with each other, but you're having a very difficult time expressing it because when you get into this place where all of a sudden hopes, dreams, and desires become expectations and then they've got their expectations, um, it removes the margin mm. for unconditional love to be recognized and to be appreciated. Mm. Like, it's just very difficult because even when I'm working my hardest to go, hey, like, I know I've always done this. I know that this is kind of how it's been for 10 years. But I'm just telling you, like, I want to regain whatever. I want you to know that I love you. I want you to put your needs above my needs. And you're working with all that you've got to try to express that and communicate that to them. And they're not feeling or receiving what you're trying to express and maybe vice versa because you're just meeting an expectation. So it literally might be out of this heart of, like, I just want to love you unconditionally. I want to revan the flames of Rome, whatever. And they're like, okay, that, but that's just what you should have done. That's what you've always done. That, that's what I've come to expect. I'll just say it this way and I'll move on. Um, if I owe you money, I can't give you money. Like if you owe me money, you can't give me money. It's just seen as a payment. And a lot of times that's what happens in marriage. I'm doing the everyday routine, but it's literally out of heart of I want to love you. 
I want to put you above me. But you don't see that anymore. You don't receive that anymore because it's just what's expected. And what happens is it removes the margin for unconditional love and intimacy. And it just feels like you can never do enough. It just feels like you're not feeling what I'm trying to express and I'm not feeling what you're trying to express. And it's not that you don't love each other, but you accidentally moved into a debt debt, a relationship of I owe you and you owe me. And now there's no margin to where the expectations are gone. So you actually get the opportunity of, I want to express unconditional love to you. It's all been eliminated and it's now just a debt debtor kind of deal. And when it happens, like you just something has to happen or yeah. give in the relationship. Yeah, and usually one of four things happens. The first is that um, you end up leaving. And this can be the person who's leveraging the expectations um, because the other person is not, in their minds, cooperating, giving them what they need. They're not living up to their end of the bargain. Um, and more often than not, though, this is the person, the person who leaves is the person who's under the weight of the expectations because they just can't measure up. They can't, they can't make it happen for that other person. They just feel like a constant disappointment. And so... You leave. The other thing is, is that you win. And this is the person who's leveraging the expectations. They end up winning. They end up coercing and convicting and controlling so much that the person who's under the weight of the expectations ends up, number three, conforming. And this one's pretty dangerous because in this situation, um, I don't know if you've heard people talk about losing themselves in a marriage or a relationship, but this is when you end up losing yourself because you're so sick and tired of fighting and feeling the pressure and the tension that you just give up altogether and you completely become the person that this other person wants you to be. You abandon yourself altogether. And the interesting thing about it is, is that it, you feel as though you've come to a solution, right? You feel like you fixed the problem because the tension's gone, the pressure's gone. You're not fighting anymore. You're not arguing anymore. But yet you both in the long run will end up losing respect for each other. And it's not founded on unconditional love because you've just simply become what the other person wants you to become. So it's really pretty dangerous. But you end up leaving, winning, or yeah. conforming. And in the winning one, basically strong, strongest personality wins. Yeah, exactly. So who do you think would win? <laughs> well, let's, let's let the people um, vote. I'm joking. Um, I'm joking. So I'm it, not really, though. I'm joking. And with winning, it's like coercing. It's like, oh, well, well, the way your family did it was stupid. We got to do it this way. Or that, that's just wrong. Or, we, the, you know, this is better. And so it just becomes this thing of, like, control, coercion, yeah. what is sometimes guilt. Um, and then the fourth thing fourth is the most subtle thing, mm. and that is you just compromise. Mm. And you're like, oh, okay, so that's, that's probably what the message is about. That's the here's how we avoid all of this. Uh-uh. Because we have um, inadvertently got the idea that actually compromise is the goal in marriage. I'm not going to ask you to raise hands, but like you probably read books or you whatever. It's like you've talked to people. And it's like, well, that's the goal. Like that's the bullseye. That's the relationship goal. Hashtag relationship goal. Compromise in marriage. It's going to be a great marriage. Maybe some of you, um, you grew up with parents or maybe it was your aunt and uncle or somebody you were close to or whatever. But there was this marriage that, that like they were married for a long time. And then you would sit down and talk to them. And they're like, well, we just figured it out. Like we just figured it out. It's hard at times. I mean, we had, to, we had to roll through some stuff. It was brutal at other times. It was tough. You know, there's moments, da, 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 which every relationship has that. And they're like, but we just figured it out eventually. And we compromised and she gave a little and I gave a little. And now, you know, we've been married for 42 years and da, da, da. And that's great. And everybody applauds and that's incredible. And then you're like, well, they're not super happy. I mean, they're not unhappy either, but they're not super happy. And it's just like one of those things where it's like, we think the goal is we'll just grind it out, figure it out, make it work, compromise enough, you know, so we can be married for a long time and then everybody applauds that. And that's great, but that's not the goal. Yeah. And what happens a lot of times in those relationships where it's a relationship based on compromise is what happens underneath the surface is there's a lot of scorekeeping. Mm. And it's good as long as you're pulling your weight and I'm pulling my weight, but it becomes a little bit contractual. And what happens in that, there's actually becomes low levels of trust. Mm -hmm. Because there's, again, there's not a lot of margin. And by the way, it's just a side note. Where there's low trust, there's low intimacy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which really hinders your sex life. And we think great sex has everything to do with sex. It has almost nothing to do yep. with sex. It has yep. everything to do with trust. Yep. When you have trust, you have intimacy. And a lot of times you have a great sex life. Yes. And we'll talk about that later in the series. Yeah, yeah you can clap for that. I haven't clapped all, all message, but I started talking about sex and you're going to get you out of your seat. Um, and that's great. Because you never, when you don't have trust, you never feel like you can fully open yourself yeah, up to the other yeah. person. You're, you, you can't be vulnerable. And so consequently, you're never fully fulfilled. So let me just put it this way and then we'll move on. Um, a compromised relationship is fueled by commitment to the wrong thing. 
because it's fueled by a commitment to the relationship. And you're yeah. like, okay, yeah, that's, that was the goal. Uh-uh, no, it's not. Because you heard, well, I'm committed to our marriage. Um, Nicole and I, early on, we had um, dinner with this couple. We'd gotten this advice from people like stock, st- stock, 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 is what I'm trying to say. Stock couples um, that like really like kind of further along, they've got some wisdom and just try to learn from them. So that's what we did. Like we just stalk people, not in a weird way, but like, hey, we just wanted to do well, we I mean, ask sometimes, questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, please meet with us. And so... We would do that, ask them questions. And it was just one couple where they, that was kind of their story. It's like, well, we've been married for a while. We just figured it out. We grinded it out. We did it, and they compromised. And, and we got done, and we walked away. And I remember us, from my recollection, like both just like, that's not what we want. Mm. That's not what we're going to pursue. Because at the end of the day, and I think I maybe even said this. I can't remember. But like, I don't want you to be committed to our marriage. Mm-hmm. I want you to be committed to me. Mm. And I want to be committed to you. And yeah. here's the thing. Like, and you know this already, but nobody marries a marriage. Yeah. You, you marry a person. Yeah. Now, I'll just say this. If all you got right now is being committed to the marriage, yeah. go for it. Stay in for that because that's better than not being committed to it. Yes. I'm just saying that's not the goal. That's yeah. not the relationship goal. And you can make it work, but it's not going to be amazing. And I don't think it's going to be all that God created it yeah. to be. Because at the end of the day, I made a commitment to Nicole that I want to love her. I want to give my life for her and vice versa. And when you get two people doing that, that's amazing relationship. Yeah. But me long term for whatever many years just being committed to the marriage, that's not that great. And there's not going to be that much intimacy. And you might even be married for 40 some years, but it's not all that God is inviting you into. And so for some of us, a lot of us, unfiltered radio podcast, you're watching, you're in the house. That's where a lot of us are. We're just yeah. committed to a marriage and God's going, no, I'm inviting you into a yeah. whole lot more. Yeah. And, and the more that he's inviting us into is the verse that we touched on a little bit last week. It's John 13, 34. And it says this, a new command I give you, love one another. And when Jesus is sharing this scripture, um, he's in the upper room. You've probably heard about the upper room, but he's just in the room with his disciples, his followers. And Jesus knows that in a couple of hours, he's going to die. And so these are some of his last words. Um, The disciples aren't aware of that yet, but these are some of his last words. And he's saying, a new command I give you, love one another. And his disciples are like, dude, (laughs) we know that already, right? The entire Old Testament, um, all of the laws and the commands are centered around loving one another. So that isn't new for us. We understand that. And Jesus is like, oh, I haven't given you the new part yet. The new part's coming. Here's the new part. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And I'm not a mind reader. I wasn't in the room, obviously. But I'm guessing that when Jesus said the second part of the verse, as I have loved you, the disciples stopped in their tracks and they started thinking through specifically how Jesus had loved each and every one of them at their absolute worst. You think about Matthew, one of the disciples, he was a tax collector, which if you have studied that culture, heard anything about the culture, um, he had aligned himself with Rome. And so the Jewish people really hated him. He took money from them. He taxed them. Um, You don't really like um, taxes, I'm sure. So you can understand some of the angst. Um, But Jesus came up to him and said, Matthew, follow me. And Matthew followed him. And then John, who ends up being referred to as the disciple of love. I don't know if you know this, but initially he was referred to as a son of thunder. He had a terrible anger problem. And yet Jesus took that anger and he turned it into love. And I could go on and on with stories about these disciples, but I think in that moment they realized this is what Jesus' love has done for us. And yet they didn't know that in just a couple of hours, Jesus was going to take it one step further and he was going to die for them. And so these are the verses that the entire New Testament centers around. When you don't know what to do, you need to ask the question, what does love demand of you? What does love demand? What did Jesus do for you? He died for you so you could have a life. And so are you laying down your life for your spouse and for those you're in relationship with? The entire New Testament centers around these verses. It's informed by these verses and it becomes terrifyingly clear of what we're to do in our relationships. When Jesus says, love as I have loved you, that's terrifyingly yeah. clear. And so when Paul comes along later, like, because Jesus sets the stage and all of the New Testament is like, here's just some examples of how you do this. Yeah. It's not new laws and new commands. Yeah. It's just like, I'll give you a couple examples and then just go do that. Yep. So when it's gray and you're not sure, what does love demand? What, what, did, what did Jesus do? What would Jesus do in this circumstance? But then Paul comes along and he's like, how do I apply this to like romantic love and marriage and relationships? And he begins to write on it. But again, it's not new. It is, okay, this is what Jesus did. Now I want to tell you how to apply that in marriage. Now, if you're not a Jesus follower, again, you don't have to do any of this. And I'm not sure sometimes, just to be honest, where you muster some of this, because there's certain moments 
If Jesus hadn't left this example, I don't know, like, it, it would be easy to just walk away. This is why I think following Jesus is so powerful. Mm. That there is a legit example in history that changes everything. Yeah. And it goes beyond, like, some of the emotions you feel in the moment. So here, Paul writes this, and the, the first verse that I'm going to read is the verse that Paul used to get everybody on the same page in the first century. And as soon as I read it, you're going to be like, oh, come on, bro. Are you serious? I like, are you ser- like, I like this church. I had respect for you. And now it's going to go all out the window. Because here's what Paul writes in this thing on relationships in Ephesians 5.22, writing to this church in Ephesus in the first century. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Now, I need to take away some of the tension I just want to let the tension no, settle no, no, in no. the room for a second. No. I just want to let it Because I heard, as soon as you started, I heard one lady over here, oh, like I she had got punched She's in like, the I'm gut. Out. I'm yeah. out my last day. Here, here's season. what y'all need to relax, ladies, is like, girls, you know if I'm up here, all right, we're not going to, you know, take this verse out of context like everybody else has done for you, okay? Because mama ain't going to submit to no one, you know what I'm saying? I'm just joking. <laughs> but no. <laughs> Whoops, we're going off the rails here. I know, we're going off the rails. Let me pull back. Let me pull back. No, I grew up in a community that they took this verse way out of context, okay? It was the man is the head of everything, the woman is to sit and be quiet. Um, All of those verses, and women didn't really have a say. If the guy said it, then that was it, and away you go. And so there's a reason why I'm no longer involved in a part of those communities and environments anymore, um, because Jesus has a lot to say against that. So just hang on for a second, let him explain it, because it's pretty awesome. Yeah, because it sounds like um, archaic, demeaning, and let's just be honest, it's not only verses, a lot of verses, where the church has used to rip out a context, yep. and then they've yep. used it to mistreat people. Yep. And uh, maybe not any more so than with women mm. um, in the church, and that's just truth. But here's what, so I started with this verse for a reason, because Paul started with, there's actually a verse right before it that I'm going to go to in a second, and then he started with this, and then he went on from there, and the reason he did, because in their culture, nobody was shocked by this verse, mm-hmm. and I'll tell you what in a second. Nobody, like, like we do, because, again, we've heard it out of context. Like, are you serious? Mm-hmm. And you've got your own story from your own background. But all, all they did was like, oh, okay, yeah. Tell us something we don't know, Paul. Like, get to some new information. <laughs> because they were under this, it was called um, patria potestas in that culture, which le- le- that meant in reality that, that men actually had legal jurisdiction mm-hmm. over women. As crazy as that is. Like, that's the culture that they lived in, this Greek Roman culture, where almost like, I mean, not less than people, but no, it was property. like, like women yeah, they were property. Like property. Yeah. And so there was this crazy thinking. So, Paul, because he's a brilliant communicator, he starts with what everybody knows. Mm-hmm. And he says, hey, wives, submit to your husbands um, as, because this is the whole marching orders, as unto the Lord. And they're like, okay, yeah, I mean, of course they're going to do that because they're kind of like property and this legal jurisdiction and like, you know, that's, we can divorce women for any reason and anytime we want. And like, that's just, how, and Paul's like, well, hold on. Because what I'm about to unpack, the reason I'm starting with this common denominator, what you guys all agree on in the first century is because I'm about to blow it all up. Yeah. And I'm about to change thinking on this and change how marriage works and change how love works. And what I started to unpack in that room before I was crucified that changed everything. I'm about to to make it painfully specific and clear to all the men in the first century. And it's going to change the world. Mm. And what's interesting is there's no verb in the oldest original text. The the, the original text actually reads this way with this verse. Some of you, I'm going to blow up all your theology in two minutes. Wives to your own husbands as to the Lord which is like really weird. But here's what they would do in the first century literature. They would infer the verb from the verse before that kind of unpacked everything that they were gonna say. And so Paul's like, I'm gonna get everybody on common ground, but I'm telling you with what Jesus has already introduced and what I'm about to say, everything is gonna change. And so wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. And then the verse right before that, 521 submit that's our verb that was the verse that was that was the verb that was actually inferred in the original it doesn't show up in verse 22 submit to who a little louder than that at the 930 submit to who oh one more time because I'm just I want to feel it submit to who oh that was good submit to one another out of reverence for your spouse submit to one another because they deserve it, or they're never going to take advantage of it. No, no, no. 
Submit to one another out of reverence for me. Again, this is the marching order of the whole New Testament because of what I did, because of what I accomplished, because of what I already did for you. I want you to do that for one another. And so the best example I've ever heard is just put it this way. Marriage relationship is a submission competition. How can I put you above me and I'm going to do what benefits you above what benefits me, which sounds horrible until you do it. And it's not that you don't have different roles or different wirings, but you're absolutely right. equal. Right. And so what Jesus is unpacking here is when in those moments where you go, God, how can I say thank you for all you've done for me, the, all, that you have, uh, all that you've accomplished, your love, your grace, your no strings attached mercy. Like, how can I say thank you? What can I do for you? And Jesus is like, you can't do anything for me. <laughs> you can do something for them. I changed the game that no longer it's about bringing sacrifices and, and worship and thinking that that's what's cool with God. Ultimately, if you really want to express your love for God and for Jesus, it's about loving the person that you're in relationship with and it's closest to you and actually being Jesus to them. And you're like, well, is there any other options? Can I give 11%? Can I go on a mission trip? Because come on, that's what we teach in churches that's a lot easier. You just check some boxes, lift your hands and yep, worship, yep, go to a small group yep. and everything's good. And Jesus is like, no, it's not. Yeah. If you want to show your love for me, it's going to be borne out in how you love them. And so he begins to unpack this new idea. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then wives, this is what you all understand in the first century, to your own husband, submit as to the Lord. And then let me get to the big crescendo, the epicenter. Everybody's jaw was dropping when Paul says what Paul says next. Yeah. And it changes everything. I'm going to read the verse and yeah. let you explain this. Yeah. But in verse 25, I'm telling you, you can't get the way to this because we view this through the lens of what Jesus introduced. Mm -hmm. and he said this, husbands, love your wives. Mm -hmm. Well, that's no big deal. That was a big deal to them. Like, what? Mm -hmm. She's my property. I have concubines. I don't really need to love her. Mm. She's just husbands. Everything's about to change. Mm. Love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Mm. And they're like, yo, I, we know how that ended. We know how Christ loved the church and we know to what extent he took that and he gave up his life for her. And Paul's like, exactly. Mm. That's what I want you to do. And I'm just telling you, they were absolutely shocked. Okay, so you're telling me we need to submit to women? You're telling me we need to submit to wives? You're telling me that there's a quality? You're telling me, like, do you know, do you know, like, how crazy they, and, Paul, and Paul's like, okay, shh. Jesus has eliminated all of your yeah. excuses. Yeah. I want you to love them the way that I loved you. And do you know the way that I loved you? I gave up my life for you. Yeah. Yeah. And so husbands, yeah. it's a huge responsibility. You know what I want you to do to create a great marriage? I want you to go and die. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Context is everything with this. It is. <laughs> Hopefully they don't put that I want. Don't tweet that. I want you... <laughs> To give up you for the sake of them. Literally, application, I want them to feel like you would give up your life for the sake of them. And see, I'll let you explain this, but like the context that they viewed this in, it like it changed okay. everything. <laughs> this is how it is, the whole so, message. Am I going to speak? Am I? No. Um, yes, I'm sorry. That's not true. <laughs> I'm not that's totally not kidding. <laughs> okay, sorry. We just lost it. There you go. You can take us to the finish line. No, I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, yeah. um, no, this, these verses were so, as, as offensive as that first verse about wives submitting to their husbands, as offensive as that was to us, this is as equally shocking to them. Because you have to understand, in this culture, I'm going to have to stand for this because I'm going to get passionate. But you have to understand, like, in this culture, they were not valuing women at all. Okay, I don't know if you guys know some of this, but um, when mothers would give birth to daughters, a lot of times those daughters were thrown outside the city as newborns in um, trash heaps. And the believers, the first century Christians, were the first to introduce adoption and foster care because they would go out there, rescue these babies, nurse them back to life, and raise them themselves. Um, I also don't know if you know this, but in the Roman culture at the time, 
um, part of their temple worship was that men could go in and sleep with concubines. They were like priests and priests, uh, priestesses of the gods. And so if your husband was like, hey, I'm going to be running a little bit late. I'm going to swing by the temple, do my worship and be home. His worship was sex with the concubines. And so you knew that when he walked in through the door. And so women were constantly degraded. They were treated as property. And so when Jesus comes in and he flips that on its head, this whole culture is like, what is going on? Jesus had women who followed him. The women were the first to the empty tomb, which back then was crazy because women were not considered accurate or reliable witnesses. So the fact, I love Jesus is so BA, but that he had two women come to the temple, um, to the tomb, I'm sorry, it's coming out. <laughs> come Don't to the, tweet that either. No, nope. uh, husbands die and BA. No, we're going to skip that. Um, but they come to the tomb first. Jesus is being like, These ladies are going to be the first to let you know that I have changed the world. Um, And then also in Paul's time, I don't know if you realize this, and I think this is so funny because churches like to skip over this, but they were lady pastors. Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you. Uh, Paul sat under the ministry of Pastor Lydia. You can look it up in Acts. And so Jesus totally turns this thing around. And and as Bryant's been talking, the the one word I keep thinking about is value, value, value. You're to value each other as Jesus valued you. He gave, he valued you so much. He gave up his life for you. And that's how you're to value each other because you both have value because he died for both of you. It's all about value. And and the whole point in this is if you were to really study history, some of you know this, Jesus changed teaching and views of women with what he introduced in the first century. And what we think is normal is not normal and not intuitive Mm -hmm. because there's other places all around the world that don't see things this way. And the statement that we put in our notes is after verse 22, where it says, wives submit yourselves to your husbands as you do to the Lord. What comes next is why what came first, which is that verse is so offensive to us because it's ripped out of context. But the reason that out of context, we even feel that like, "Ah, I don't know about that. And I've heard things go way off the rails with that teaching is because of what through Paul, Jesus says next, where he says, hey, you guys think you're better, you're not. And so I'm leveling the playing field. And so I want you to submit to one another out of reverence and love for me because of my love for you. And so I'm just telling you, I can't say this enough. Women are valued equally. That is not natural. That was introduced by Jesus. And I would just say this in all seriousness, the dignity with which Jesus gave women is why women should follow Jesus, even if they don't understand a lot of what Jesus taught. Because Jesus changed the game on this. If you don't believe me, go back and study. And so uh, that whole that whole setup was so that Paul could get to verse 25. And so, okay, so now, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then verse 28, in the same way, husbands, you ought to love your wives as your own bodies. Mm-hmm. That literally they should feel like you're going to lay down your life emotionally, physically, and spiritually to protect them just like you would do for you. Mm-hmm. And then he says this, he who loves his wife loves himself and what Paul's talking about is this is the mystery of one that when you come together in relationship you literally become one not in some ethereal way but literally you become one there's a soul connection that happens that God creates and God owns the patent on marriage and relationship he knows how this thing works and so literally when you love her you're you're loving you and and there's this this oneness of taking care of her is like taking care of you and Jesus through the writings of Paul and Paul as he's pinning it is going that's what I want you to do yeah That's what I want relationship to look like. And it goes both ways. It is mutually submitting to one another. Literally, marriage is a submission competition. How can I submit my hopes, my dreams, and my desires for the sake of your hopes, your dreams, and your desires? And next week, we're going to talk about, just real quick before we end, how to do that. Because there's nothing wrong with these hopes, dreams, and desires. In a lot of cases, they're God-given. But you got to move them back out of the expectations category. And yeah, there is something that you need to do with them, but it's not placing a weight of expectation Mm. on your spouse. Yeah. And so what you've got to think is right now that the application, part of the application of this is what is life to you? What do you value as much as you value your own life? And you've got to take your spouse and put them in front of that. But you can't do that with a massive box of expectations. And so you've got to take that box back and you've got to take all your expectations out and you've got to start putting them back into the hope, dreams, and desires box. And then you have to decide. You have to decide that your spouse is no longer going to owe you anything. 
They owe you nothing. Jesus eliminated all of that when he died on the cross for you because you owe Jesus absolutely nothing. And so you have to make the decision that your spouse owes you nothing. And then your spouse has to make the decision that you owe them nothing. It's a mutual decision. But you know what? Some, some in this room, you're gonna decide that together. And then some in this room, you're not gonna decide that together. And that's what, like, what we talked about last week. One of you is gonna have to decide to go first. And Brian's gonna talk about it in a second yeah. how scary that is, but it's a decision. Yeah, You've gotta make this that whole decision. Thing seems unrealistic, yeah. and I get that, and we're talking more about it next week because I know that, well, you, you, you don't know what's gonna happen, or am I just gonna be a doormat? Am I just gonna be over here in the corner, and they're gonna whatever, and they're gonna take advantage of me? We have all of our excuses, and I know you wanna raise your hand. Well, let me tell you my story, my relationship. I get it. Yeah. I get it. But I'm just telling you, like, it's never gonna end the way you want it to. You might make it work. But it's never going to end the way you want it to as long as all of these have moved to this place of expectations in your relationship. And so last week, we just asked this question, like, what are your expectations? And I want to say this real fast. Yeah. I'm sorry, because I just feel led by the Lord to say this. Like, the 10 years we've been doing this, we've heard a lot of stories. And I just think someone out there needs to hear this. We've heard a lot of really crazy stories. And this makes me emotional. But I can tell you, Jesus can transform anything. He can redeem and restore anything. And so I just feel led to tell, I'm not sure who needs to hear this because I'm not sure what mess you find yourself in the middle and, and how hopeless you feel right now. But we have heard so many stories of how Jesus has redeemed incredibly broken marriages where on the outside looking in, you'd think that marriage was hopeless and it was over. And Jesus said, not on my watch. And so some of you need to hear that this morning. And next week we're gonna talk about the fact that there were some moments early on. We've been married for almost 10 years. Nine of them have been amazing. Um, <laughs> it's true though. I mean, it's true. He's speaking that, truth. That first year, there were some moments where it's like, man, everything that I had as a hope, dream, and desire, it's, it's being crushed, trampled. And, um, and vice versa, I'll speak for you sure. too, right? Yeah, it was, yeah. it was tough. And God did something through that. And last week we asked you like, okay, what are your expectations? And we gave you this, like, hey, do not go and talk about this on the way home last week because you're not ready and this is going to blow up. But you gotta, you gotta think about that. Somebody tried it. You gotta think about that. Like what? what like I'm are, testifying. Like, no, you're right. <laughs> yeah. um, what are your expectations? But then here, here's the big question that, and I'm serious about that. I know it seems crazy, but just to you, not on the ride home, but when the time is right with, with, with your spouse specifically, and, and even if you're in a relationship, right? Dating relationship, man, start now. Yes. As we said last week, yes. what are your hopes? What are your dreams? What are your desires? Like and, legitimately asking that. And question. the ladies are going to love this question because we, some of us have been waiting for years, right, for the dudes to ask this. But ladies, just to let you know this ahead of time so you're not shocked when you go to ask the man in your life, okay, what are your hopes, dreams, and desires? This will be the response. Nothing. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> is there XFL football on today? Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. And the thing is, like, they le we legitimately don't know. <laughs> like, or we've never thought about it. What it's was gonna, that laugh, first gonna, of all? Well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm just being real. But you don't know. You haven't thought about it. And here's, here's my hunch. And I just, for whatever reason, I don't know how we're wired or whatever. This scares us to death to answer that question. And, and what I would say guys just to talk to you for a second like because I, I some of I get it the problem is you're scared to death to answer that question but you're asking them to fulfill that expectation yeah. and you got to get to the bottom of it and you got to communicate it and I think what's the heart of it is vulnerability and we don't like to be vulnerable and it's really really difficult but it's what it requires. And I think on the other side, no matter who it is, I think you just gotta listen. So if you're the one that receiving and you just gotta not talk, like not say anything. Some of you, if your spouse or your significant other in, in relationship did this, it, it's gonna kind of floor you um, because they've been living out of their own box for a while, just trying to get you to fulfill their stuff. Um, for others, you'd probably be angry. Like we've been married for 20 years. You don't know my hopes, dreams, and desire. Just take it and just listen. But seriously, what, what are those hopes? What are those dreams? What are those desires? And what I would say is this, <clears throat> that's the less self question. Yeah. And the relationship goal is less of me and more of you. And I'm just telling you, it's not intuitive. You are not 
going to read that many places, but it is the catalyst for great and amazing relationship. But here's where I know all of the angst is, because for some of you, you're in this place to go, well, if I do that, if I take the pressure off, you have no idea what they're going to do. You have no idea where that's going to lead. You have no idea what's not going to get done. You have no idea what's happened in the past. Da, da, da. I, if, I, if I take the pressure off them, I'm, I'm what, what are you? I'm, I'm afraid. And I get that. I just want to tell you this in as much love and grace as I can. That's not a marriage. That's not a relationship. It, it may be a relationship, but it's a parent-child relationship. And it's never gonna be what you want. And here's the reality, let's just be real. There's no guarantees. There's no guarantees when I take these back and almost drop them because they're so heavy and try to give this to them. Like, when, There's no guarantees, but I've never seen a marriage that is either healed or is great because somebody coerced and controlled. And the reality is if you stay in this fear-based whatever and just, well, I'm just going to settle. We're going to grind it out and make it work. It's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Because what will end up happening is you will be disappointed in marriage. And you'll be disappointed with relationships. And so here it is, Jesus followers. You got to go first. No matter how bad it is or how bad he is, or how bad she is, or how desperate it seems right now, you've gotta go first. It is your only hope and your only way forward if you want all that God is inviting you into. Because while you were dead in your trespasses and sin, Christ yes. set down all of the expectations. Yep. Yep. And he went to the cross and died not expecting anything yes. in return. And now he says to you, and maybe somebody should have told you before I do, go and do that for your spouse. Yes. I want you to love them like that. And I know it doesn't seem amazing and I know nobody celebrates it in culture and it would seem like the pathway to a great relationship is me getting mine and you getting yours. But I'm just telling you, Jesus knows. Jesus yeah. created it and you're never ever gonna come to it on your own. But the path to amazing relationship and amazing sex and intimacy and all that God wants is to give up you and all of your hopes, your dreams and desires for the sake of them. And if you get two people doing it, you will experience Yes. the beauty of what God has designed relationship yes. to be and it's possible and so as we get ready to close the question is what does love demand of you right now I know you have all the excuses in the world I know what they did I know what your past says what, what does love demand and love demands this that you submit yourself to one another out of reverence for what Jesus has done for you because at the cross God went first. And I know they don't deserve it, but it's not based on what they deserve, just like it wasn't based on what you deserved and Jesus did it anyway. And so he says to you, go first. And the relationship goal is to put each other first by going first in an effort to be last. And nobody's gonna celebrate that. But if you get that, it's good. And last thing. The very thing that you need more than anything else in the world is the very thing that as long as you're holding on to these expectations, your spouse can't give you. Yeah. Because the thing that you need most in the world is unconditional love. But you have to give them the opportunity to communicate it. And so what does love demand of you? And would you be willing to go first, whatever the situation is, to go, I don't know if you're ever going to join me. I don't know if we're ever going to get there. I don't know if you're ever going to let down. I don't know if you're ever going to drop your expectations. But because of what Jesus has done for me, I'm dropping mine. And I'm just going to invite him in to see what he do. And so that's our prayer. And would you just, yeah. just kind of pray um, and cast so vision? So would you guys just bow your heads? Because I, I, I think, I don't know, that Brian and I have felt the weight of this whole series. And what we think Jesus really is wanting to do. And so as you've bowed your heads and closed your eyes, um, I think some of you need to um, be bold enough to say, okay, I'm going to be the one that goes first. Or maybe you're sitting there with your spouse or um, your significant other, your partner, and you're like, we're going to go together. We decided we're going to go together. And so if as you've been sitting through this and you're like, I'm going to go first or we're going to go together, would you just take a stand right now and eyes are closed but it's still going to be scary because you're going to stand and your spouse is going to feel you standing 
But I think some of you need to be bold enough and you need to stand before Jesus and say, keep like those around me, they can keep me accountable, but I'm gonna be bold enough to go first and I'm gonna lay down my expectations. I'm gonna put those back in the correct box and I'm gonna see what Jesus is gonna do. It's amazing. I love it. And then some of you are here and you're like, gosh, um, I don't know what that unconditional love is. I don't, I don't understand it. And it's because you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior. You've never come to that moment where you've realized Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, that he rose again, and he wants a personal relationship with you. And so if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, wherever you are right now, you can just pray this to Jesus and you can use your own words, but you just say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again and I'm asking you to save me. And if that's you this morning, if you prayed that and you asked Jesus to be your savior so that you can experience that unconditional love, would you mind standing so I can just um, pray over you and celebrate this with you? Eyes are closed, heads are bowed, but if you accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, it's amazing. Makes me emotional. Awesome. Jesus, I'm so moved. I have chills right now. I'm so moved by what you're doing in our gathering over these few weeks. God, I'm moved by those people who accepted you as their personal savior at both first service and second service, God, who were on their way to death. And yet, God, you turned it around and now they have life and they're gonna experience the unconditional love that they've been so desperate to find. God, I'm moved by the men and the women who have decided to go first, who have stood. And as I've stood up here and watched, I, I, I watch wives take a stand and then their husbands decide to stand with them. Or I watch husbands stand and their wives stand. And I watch couples stand together. I watch some stand alone. And Jesus, I am just so excited to see what you are going to do, Lord, with these marriages, God. I am so excited to see how you are gonna restore, redeem, how you are gonna breathe hope back into death. God, we want to be a light and a beacon for all that you are doing in our lives. God, we love you so much. Thank you for being the God of resurrection. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.